The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you. It may be the holiday season for many, but that doesn't mean it's fun for everyone. Tonight we speak to author Heather O'Neill on how to cope with tricky family dynamics. Then as a new season begins for the Toronto Raptors, Steve talks to sports writer Doug Smith, whose new book maps their 25-year journey from that Canadian team to We the North champs. And from our Ontario hubs, we'll find out why the SIU Special Investigations Unit is involved after a child was shot and killed in Eastern Ontario. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, it's Friday, December 18th, and that's ahead on the agenda. It's hard to escape the sentiment during this time of year that we should be happy and jolly. But what about anxious, sad, frantic, or even scared? For some, the holidays can be challenging, even without the backdrop of a pandemic. Heather O'Neill is a writer and novelist whose work has twice won the Hugh McLennan Prize for fiction. In her 2018 book, Wisdom and Nonsense, Invaluable Lessons from My Father, she reflected on dealing with difficult relationships, and she joins us now from Montreal for her perspective. Hi, Heather. It's so nice to meet you. Oh, it's wonderful to meet you, too. I know you hear this a lot, but your writing is phenomenal. It just stays with you. Um, so it's a pleasure to be able to talk to you about this. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, to start our conversation, I wanted to read an excerpt from your book, Wisdom and Nonsense. And you write, When I was five years old, my parents got divorced. My mother packed me up and put me in the back seat of our burgundy car. She tossed my dad's stuff out of the trunk, and we drove down to Virginia. After two and a half years of moving around, she told me she had changed her mind about wanting to be my mother. She put me on a plane, and I showed up back in Montreal. I just want to go over that one sentence. She told me she had changed her mind about wanting to be my mother. That's mm -hmm. a sentence that just hits you right here. What was it like for you as a five-year-old to hear that from your own mom? Um, I was seven at the time, and... It was something that was also reiterated to me over the years. Um, it was it was just devastating because it made me feel that I didn't even deserve a mother, and that she had this option to leave me if I if she wanted. And you know, essentially, I was broken up with by my mother, and it, it was kind of an abandonment feeling that I'd never gotten over, and it kind of haunts me. Do you remember that moment when you did part? I do. I remember, um, actually, what I remember more was arriving in Montreal. I don't actually remember so much. I think I blocked that out, the saying goodbye. I just remember arriving in Montreal and then encountering my father, who I had no memory of at that time. And it was just this very um, burly, tough-looking guy with, you know, kind of crazy hair, and he just gave me this big hug, and I was like... Um, who is this mm -hmm. um, very like stranger? So it's you and your dad in Montreal. What was it? Mm -hmm. What was he like as a person, as a father? Um, I mean, he was a very colorful character. He was. Um, he had been at, when he, he was born in the late 1920s, and uh, when he was young, he kind of became involved in the Montreal underworld and was a criminal. And, you know, after the Second World War, he had decided to straighten up his act, but he always felt that that was a mistake and he had missed his calling because the only time he had kind of ever done well in the world when he, was when he was a criminal. So when I was a little girl, he would just, as bedtime stories, tell me all these very um, eccentric, over-the-top, uh, rose-colored portraits of the Montreal crime scene in the 30s and 40s, and they were sort of... Um, became, yeah, these little lullabies for me. And that really affected my writing, his ability to romanticize the most um, kind of dark um, areas and chapters in the world. 
It's from reading the um, your book. It seemed as if he wanted to instill in you um, that you could do anything and that you were larger than life. Oh yeah, I mean he was a fantasist, but he kind of brought me along with him. And I mean we made an odd couple because he had uh, left school at grade three and he couldn't really read. And then he had this little girl with him, who was uh, just I mean I just loved reading books and would just disappear in them and was always writing. So um, then he had through me he 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 kind of wanted to be into the intellectual world. So he would always um, come up with these stories. And how I could be perceived as an intellectual in the world. So he would tell me to tell everyone he was a philosophy professor and that I was a child of, of philosophers. How would you, like looking back, because I think sometimes, um, I think as we get older, we look at our parents more as people instead of our parents who are infallible and belong to us. When you look back on your childhood, how would you describe your upbringing with him? Uh, very erratic. We would, um, there were moments that were quite wonderful and we would, um, go through the neighborhood and, you know, have our dinner on a bench and just watch street performers and talk about fun things. But there were other moments where he would just become very, um, violent and have these outbursts and, you know, and throughout my life, I would just like crawl out the fire escape and run away and stuff. So it was very um, back and forth. So there were these moments that were lovely and touching, which I still have and hold. And there are other moments that were quite brutal that I have, um, you know, difficult memories of. You know, um, I just wanted to go back a little bit on what she said. Assuming uh, your mom knew him, knew who mm -hmm. he was, um, yeah. and yet she entrusted him to take care of a vulnerable um, child. Mm -hmm. As an as a grown up now, are you able to square that? Like, how do you reconcile that? That she left you with somebody that puts you in dangerous situations. Um, I can't really reconcile it. It's um, that's what makes it difficult for me. I'm not angry with her, but we can never have a relationship because I can never get over that. That not only did she leave me, but she left me knowing that I was going to be in a difficult situation, that I was going to suffer um, abuse and whatnot. And she knew that full well. And I even spoke on the phone with her once um, and told her about it. So, you know, that makes any kind of relationship between us pos impossible, I think. We're during their holiday season, and um, it can be a very hard time for a lot of people because I think this is the time of year where family and merriment and, you know, uh, when you look back on your childhood, what was Christmas like? Um, again, everything was so uh, crazy back then. There was, you know, there was really fun moments. Like, I remember once my dad had... Um, I had put something out for Santa Claus to see if he existed. And then I woke up and my dad had kind of uh, made these footprints all around my bed with temporary golden spray paint. And, of course, and then I woke up and I was terrified because it was like, Santa Claus has been all over the room. We have to <laughs> laugh. <laughs> Are there any other uh, memories of Christmas that stick out the most? <laughs> Beyond Santa being in your room <laughs> while you sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then there were other, it, it was sad because we were um, so down and out all the time. And once um, a social worker came by to see me on Christmas just to make sure I was actually getting any gifts that year. And she had brought me a toy poodle that had a little key mm -hmm. that would wind up and would play music. But then I wound it up and it didn't play any music at all. And it was just this broken poodle and it. It just made me cry and I, but I wasn't, I was just crying and I felt I was weeping for my entire situation in the whole world and it became this, and I couldn't stop crying. Mm -hmm. And now every Christmas, like I wake up even last year and I just wake up in the morning and I just start weeping with, um, I don't know what it is. It's like this disappointment or feeling of vulnerability and that everything is broken. Why do you think Christmas does that? 
Well, there's so much pressure. You see so many images of this kind of perfect family and families getting together, and it's all very functional and like nuclear families and very middle class. And so inevitably, I you compare your own situation to it, and nobody kind of lives up to that hallmark image. Everybody, everybody's family is a bit odd, and you have everybody has losses and you know dealing with relatives who are a bit problematic or whatnot. So just don't fit into that mold. And I and I feel that the expectation of it just makes people feel so lonely and kind of inadequate. You've said that the holidays make you feel little again. In what ways? Mm -hmm. um, it just bring when I wake up, it just brings me back. Because I think everybody associates uh, Christmas with childhood. And then so immediately, I'm always back and I'm little again. And it's, but it's even more devastating. Because at that, when I was first a child, I didn't actually realize to what extent I was deprived of things or mistreated. And now when I look back and, and I'm in those, I'm sort of in that place again, it just breaks my heart mm -hmm. how lonely and vulnerable and how nobody kind of reached out to really take me out of that place or help me kind of navigate it. Um, the holidays also cause you grief. Why grief? Grief, I think, I think just grief for, for the loss of my mother, for the loss of, it's just a profound sadness of um, having to, had to live through all those Christmases to get to where I am now. And I feel, um, I mean, when I did leave home and then I realized I didn't have to celebrate Christmas because it was such a wonderful, it was like this burden off my shoulder and I didn't have to be stuck with a, a family. I just got to be all by myself and do what I wanted and was in control of my life. So but I just feel, I feel grief for the little me, I think. In a way, it's kind of like um, you're fed this uh, ideal of, what life is supposed to be, and then when you don't have that ideal, it makes you feel less than, like there's something wrong with you. Oh yeah, of course, of course. It's always, it just seems that Christmas is so performative and people are always angry at each other and you have to do the perfect Christmas and then. But presents. <laughs> nobody, can, nobody can live up to that, to that pressure. Yeah. You know, and it's also like I was saying, I kind of one of the reasons I've come through this all is because I've realized that even if you don't measure up to those images of bizarre middle class family life, you're still a wonderful person and you can still have your own rituals and celebrations. And, you know, even if you don't have a family mm. or you're alone or well, I don't know. You wrote on Twitter, um, I'm getting ahead of the game and canceling Christmas for myself. There should be a calendar for the abused where we have all new holidays that don't cause us to shudder with trauma. Uh, you know, we're all familiar with the hallmark narrative of the holidays, family, sitting around the fire, um, eating good food and um, uh, being together. Do you think that the narrative for the holidays should also include the fact that there's, it's also a very difficult time of the year for a lot of people? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it. we should just realize that there are so many people waking up with this intense feeling of longing and regret and um, absence. So many people have absences that um, feelings, people that they're missing. And um, yeah, and it causes so much anxiety. It's hard to say why. It's almost, it's almost this manufactured emotion that... Um, we're all feeling. So I think somehow it should be incorporated into Christmas, um, this inclusivity of different feelings people are having. And it's not just happy holidays or joyous holidays. It's um, the profound holidays. We should just call it like the profound moment. We're all just feeling this um, deep feeling together. And, and there just needs to be more of a collective 
idea of what Christmas is and not forgetting um, other people and other families. I mean, it's called the most uh, wonderful time of the year. Is it harder now um, um, against the backdrop of the pandemic or does, does that make any difference? For me mm -hmm. or for every For you? Um, I think, I think it's a little, I haven't even thought of it actually. I thought um, maybe there's less pressure for people. We'll see what happens. I mean, it's, it's, we're all going to be forced to have these unusual Christmases this year. Mm -hmm. And even like usually for Christmas, my daughter and I, we just go to Chinatown and see a movie because I just refuse even like the smell of a pine tree in the house makes, uh, gives me such feelings of anxiety. Mm -hmm. So we're not even going to be able to do our ritual. Um, so yeah, it's going to be it's going to be an unusual Christmas this year. But one of the perhaps is interesting because we're all suffering the exact same um, situation. Um, before we run out of time, I want to get into some of the lessons that you write about um, that you your dad taught you. And um, I, the, the book is called Wisdom and Nonsense. Why nonsense? Because they seem like such ridiculous um, ideas, all the lessons my dad would teach me. But within them, I've kind of, I really used them uh, to kind of become somebody interesting in the world and navigate. So lesson number one was your father told you to never keep a diary. Why? Oh, uh, that was funny because um, I got an uh, empty journal one year for my birthday. And in it, I began just transcribing, you know, my day-to-day -day life and everything that was going on around us. And my dad always had his old criminal friends and his, who were up to no good. And I would just record everything. And it was just like so wonderful to be able to turn life into words. And then when I was done, my dad would just be like, he would just burn my diaries or throw them out. And he was like, you've got to stop this. They were, they're going to be used against us all in court. So, um, but you get a yeah. sense, too, that um, it was kind of like you were keeping a reckoning of him. Totally. Yeah, it was in, in an unflattering way. And then all the because something unusual would happen and then I just go immediately and write it down. And it's mm -hmm. like, stop taking notes on our entire life. <laughs> Another lesson was uh, you should learn to play the tuba. What was the thinking behind that? Um, well, my dad thought there was always, uh, I mean, he had no idea how one went out in the world and actually made some money. So he had this idea when I was a kid that there weren't enough tuba players. Mm -hmm. So when I got to high school, if I could be allowed to play the tuba, then I would never be unemployed because there would always be work for tuba players because they were so, um, there's always a shortage of them. <laughs> Okay, well, I have to get, I have to, we're running out of time. I don't want to get into a few more of these. Another lesson was accept that you're ugly and move on. Um, and I want to read a quote from that. You write, my father said that when I was a baby, I was so ugly that he was afraid to look at me. He would close his eyes and say, no, she can't be that ugly. But then when he opened them, there I was even uglier than he remembered. As a child, he told me he was afraid a wind would pick me up and carry me away because my ears were so large. He called me chicken legs as an affectionate nickname because he said I was so skinny. I grew up thinking I was but ugly. I mean, this is just horrible stuff. Um, <laughs> what were the lessons there? Um, yeah, it's a, I mean, I, I don't think anybody's ugly. Like whenever I hear that word, somebody being described as ugly, I, like, I hate it. I, I just say no, no woman is ugly. There's, I just find um, we, I mean, I love the sparkle in people's eyes and when they have intelligence or something to say. And I think, yeah, just having this idea that I was ugly kind of, it turned around for me and I really realized that beauty's on the inside and I became very, um, just so frustrated by that word and the idea that we judge each other by physical appearance. And especially as women and young women, we just have this idea that we're in the male gaze and our value is in our appearance. And for me, that was always, um, I mean, I thought I was ugly. So I just was like, well, what can you do? I have to have to develop intellectual skills and whatnot and other ways to um, 
prove my my self worth. But I feel everybody kind of needs to do that. And and yeah, like I said, it's just we're all so beautiful. I find I just find people beautiful. I mean, the fact that as a child that didn't break you is incredible. Another lesson that you write about that he taught you is to never watch Paul Newman movies. Why? Oh, my dad was obsessed with Paul Newman because he was the same age as Paul Newman. And my dad had been very attractive when he was young. And that was one of the things he was, he was a very vain man. So he didn't understand why Paul Newman had got this acclaim in the world and he hadn't. And he would just kind of um, criticize Paul Newman's acting and say, I could never watch it because Paul, um, Paul Newman had what he needed to have and somehow had stolen it from him. Um, you, in this book, you write affectionately about your father and the lessons that he taught you, yet your father was abusive. How do you reconcile those two things? Um, like I said, it's very difficult, and I don't, and I go through periods where um, some periods are, are lighter, and then, um, yeah, especially, I think that's one of the reasons I use these lessons in life and I talk about these things because it makes it easier to kind of focus on the good things. And then there are moments when just the reality of it and comes and hits me in a harder way. So, and you never kind of know what phase you're going to go through. Oftentimes, oddly, it depends on right on what I'm writing because writing actually helps me um, deal with like bring the good stuff up. So I, and I, and I kind of try and hold on to that, even though, um, you know, there's, there's just the reality that there are very hard moments and that I suffered a lot through. Heather, thank you so much for sharing um, so much of yourself with us. We really appreciate it. And uh, because it is the pandemic, hopefully an opportunity for all of us to create new traditions. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. Pro basketball is gearing up for a new season, and though last season didn't turn out as many had hoped for the Toronto Raptors, the last few years have been historically fabulous for the franchise. Basketball writer Doug Smith has been on this beat since day one, and his new book, We the North, 25 Years of the Toronto Raptors, captures that story on the court and beyond. He is the Toronto Star's hoops expert, and he joins us now from Mississauga for more. Doug, so good to see you again. How you doing, my friend? I'm good, Steve. Good to see you, too. It's been a long time. Well, we're going to walk down all 25 years of memory lane here, starting, if we can, Sheldon, bring up the first picture, if you would. November 3rd, 1995, 25 years and a few weeks ago. This is at the Sky Dome, as we then called it. The first ever Raptors game, and you were there. What do you remember from that night? Ha, it's funny, Steve. You know, the thing I remember most is the national anthem. It How was come? maybe... It was maybe four or five days after Quebec referendum that passed, what, 5149 in a very contentious time in our country. The bare naked ladies sang the national anthem. They broke into French in the middle stanza, and the crowd cheered. And to me, that was a very Canadian moment. It's going to be the thing that I take away from that night, even more than the basketball, the, the fact that as a Canadian sports story, that was a very touching moment. And it, it, it stuck with me now for 25 years. I'm getting chills actually just thinking about it as I did when I read that passage in your book. Interesting though, I thought you might say the Raptors won the game and yeah. Mighty Mouse became a star. Tell us about him. Damon, Damon Stoudemire was, you know, as you know, Steve, the first face of the franchise, the first first round draft pick, a little overachieving left-handed guard, four years of college, kind of in the same mold as Isaiah Thomas, frankly. And, you know, the fans booed when he was drafted. They wanted a Ed O'Bannon out of UCLA. But Damon had this kind of will about him that, that he just played hard, would not accept losses well. And I think Canadian and Toronto sports fans appreciate that in their athletes. And he quickly, he quickly turned the crowd and the fans into his favor because just the way he played, he just played hard and, and wanted to win every night out despite the fact the team was overmatched talent-wise. I want to ask you about you just for a second here because, and again, we're going to situate this in the time. The Blue Jays are only a, you know, a few years removed from, actually only two years removed from their second World Series victory. The Leafs had a pretty good team at that time. They'd gone deep into the playoffs. There wasn't really all that much interest, apparently, in this new basketball team in terms of reporting. 
Why did you put your name forward? Well, you're right. There weren't a lot of hands going up when people were asking around who wanted to do this. Um, you know, I had known the game a little bit. I had played at high school and college, knew some guys in the national team program, had had covered the dream team in the 1992 Olympics in Barcelona and uh, in Portland before that. So I appreciated the game. But I also, you know, as a journalist, you want to get in on history. And this was the first franchise that was starting in Canada since, I guess, 1977 in the Blue Jays. And there was a historic nature to it. And to be able to sort of chronicle the, the development and, and the, or the origins of it, that was pretty intriguing as a reporter. And, you know, it, it sort of paid off. It was sort of turned, turned out to be the pretty right decision, I think. Mm -hmm. Plus, I couldn't skate. <laughs> what do you mean? You're Canadian? You can't skate? No, I could not. I cannot skate at all. I'm not... Those 5.30 in the morning, Saturday morning hockey practices were not in my bag. <laughs> okay, good enough. Let's talk about the first major executive that the Raptors brought in to try to turn things around, Isaiah Thomas. He had been a big name from the Detroit Pistons where he'd won a couple of championships with them, so he's got that championship pedigree. What was his role, in your view, in turning Canada into a basketball-loving country? He, he was the ultimate salesman. He was a gregarious guy. He would go and talk to the service clubs, the... The, the businessmen's organizations to sell the games, sell the tickets, sell the franchise. I think he knew that it was a hard sell because, frankly, it was a, a hockey city. And it, he had a very dynamic personality. You know, Isaiah, as a player, was a very tough guy, played on those bad boys piston team that won championships. But as, as a person, he just had this way about getting to people. And, and I think he was a rather inspired hire just for his personality. He was willing to do the work and talk to the right people and convey the right message that this sport was going to work in Toronto and that the force of his personality would help it succeed in a market where, you know, it was touch and go at times, that, that you didn't know whether the, the people were going to accept this new American sport. Well, I was going to ask you, how well did Toronto fans, or, you know, fans for that matter from anywhere who came to the games, how well did they know the game? Oh, not very well at all. They couldn't. You know, there were there were parts of the, the technical aspects of the game that were just out of their out of the realm. They just, they just didn't quite understand. Them. They got they came to understand them, but the other stuff that shocked them the the dance packs, the mascot, the stuffed animals running around, the the playing of music during the competition was something that was unheard of in, in Canadian sports. And it took a long time, a little you know, quite a while for the bulk of the fans to go, okay, this is not just a game. This is uh, an experience. And the, the basketball fan, it took a little while to get used to that because they were used to going to hockey games where basically you sat on your hands until the team scored and then you cheered or you listen to Stomp and Tom Connor sing. <laughs> and that was, that was the entertainment. You know, basketball was a, almost a sensory overload kind of thing. There was always something going on. That's how I was going to put it. It's almost a two-hour nonstop assault on your senses, if you like. Now, a lot of people like that. What, what did you think of it all? Uh, I knew it was coming. I didn't particularly like it. And it's gotten worse over the years. You know, and back, if you look at, I presume if you watch the 95 game closely, you wouldn't be nearly as inundated with stuff as you are today. Every time out has a contest. Every arena has some screaming in-game host that, that sort of cheer, tells the fans when to cheer. I, 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 pref I prefer the basketball as the basketball. But I also understand that in this day and age, and especially now, in the way that society is, you need to be entertained every minute. The, the attention span is mostly of gnats. <laughs> and you need to have something going on around you that keeps you up, up and occupied so that the game becomes not secondary to the event, but it's just part of a bigger thing. Well, in some respects, you can understand it because the first few years, after all, were pretty terrible. I mean, in the 97-98 season, the team won 16 games and lost 66. Did you they ever did. think at that time about walking away that this just might not as be as much fun as you thought it was going to be? Well, I'll tell you, in that year, they won their, they won their, they lost their first two games, won their third, and then lost 19 in a row. And I covered every one of those 19 games. <laughs> and I figured if I survived that, I could get through pretty much anything. Because about 12 games into a losing streak, you walk in a locker room and you got nothing to say and they got nothing to answer. And as a reporter, that's a really difficult time to, to handle. But, yeah, we knew they were going to take losses and they weren't going to be good. They were sort of hamstrung by the uh, expansion agreement with the league on what players they could get, how much money they could spend. 
And as as a journalist, the fun thing was you were telling stories about people as opposed to games. You couldn't write about the game because the games were all the same. Hmm. You were you were introducing readers to different personalities and people. And if you stuck it out when they didn't want to talk to you and got good stories out of it, then you knew that the things were going to take off. Eventually, they had to get better. And they did, eventually. It took a while, but they did. Well, I wonder if part of the problem was the Raptors were, unlike in the NHL where there are seven Canadian teams, the Raptors are the one and only Canadian team in a league where everybody else is playing stateside. And I wonder how big a, a selling job it was to try to get players to come up here in the beginning. Oh, you, you would have thought your asshole would come to Mars. Hmm. They, they didn't want to come here. They had, had they, the metric system was confusing. Their bags of milk, the, the TV was different. They couldn't see their ESPN. Um, the food was different. Their grocery stores were different. There was, it took a lot of sales. They thought they were going into another part of Earth rather than just a, basically an extension of the society they lived in. But yeah, it, it, Glenn Grumwald and Isaiah Thomas, the first executives, had a hard time selling agents on sending their players here, players on coming to live in a city where, you know, people talk about Toronto being cold, but you're also bringing guys from Milwaukee and Detroit and Chicago and, you know, not necessarily balmy uh, neighborhoods, but it was a different country. And there were issues of taxation. There were issues of where you live. There was all kinds of things that took a lot of convincing that, you know, once they got them here, once they got players here, they realized that Toronto's a pretty damn good city. It was very cosmopolitan, very worldly. But the Americans, they thought they were going to some horribly foreign place where they spoke a different language, let alone lived a different lifestyle. I'm blanking on the guy's name now. That, that player who said, my kids, you know, they're in the school system, they don't get this. Uh, his wife had and, and, a problem with it as well. Who was that? Antonio Davis. Antonio and, Davis. Yeah. And it, 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 uh, uh, concern about the kids learning the metric system, which, yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, wow. You know, just at, at, at some point, about a year and a half in, I would just roll my eyes. Oh, come on. This is, let's just, let's just go. Well, things changed uh, rather dramatically when, and how shall we describe this guy? He's sort of half man, half amazing slam dunk artist. There is the inimitable Vince Carter. What was his impact on the organization? Well, I, I don't want to say he saved basketball here, but he certainly gave it a legitimacy. All of a sudden, when Vince in that, that 1999, 2000, 2001 era, 2002, he was at at one time, one of the top 10 basketball players on earth. And he played for the Toronto Raptors, which gave the Raptors a legitimacy and a profile globally that they never had and, and never would have had had he not been here. Um, he didn't, like I say, I don't think he saved the franchise, but he gave it a stamp. And he was electrifying. You know, we would go on the road and, and people would be at the hotel to get autographs. They would, before the game, they would be sort of stalking the bus. Every game he played, just about every game he played in the 400 and so that I watched him, he did something that made you go, holy crap, <laughs> isn't that something else? And, and I think, you know, fans here took to that. He was ours. He, he was Toronto's Vince Carter. And uh, that made the Raptors, it gave him a legitimacy in the sport. Now, I know you two have a good, uh, close relationship. He's, good. He's done the forward to your book, after all. But having said that, he had a pretty terrible breakup with the franchise. Uh, what happened there? Horrible. I, I, I you know... 24 games into the season, he didn't particularly play all that well. I don't think he got as many shots as he was used to. I think the team was pivoting away to a Chris Bosch team as opposed to a Vince Carter team. And he got traded for a bag of donuts, and I think people resented him for what the return for him was. And I, I think he took a little bit of heat unnecessarily. And, yeah, it, it didn't end well. But, you know, Steve, when superstars leave teams, it seldom ends well. The, the, the fact that Vince was sort of blamed for his departure was not unusual. I think the vitriol was a little bit over the top and it lasted too long. But yeah, he was not blameless in it, but I think the people took it to an extent that they probably shouldn't have. I, I'm sure you were at the game. I was at the game as well, where he came last season to play his final game in Toronto. He's now played more than any player in NBA history. That's astonishing. I, I, you would I, I could have retired betting that 25 years ago. He mm. played 22 years in the NBA. I didn't think he would last 10. Mm. He, he will go down. And there will be no player who plays 22 seasons in the NBA ever again. There's too much money. There's too much wear and tear on their body. The, that person does not exist. I cannot see it happening. Um, and to think that he started here and 
uh, had the length of his career it, it is incredible to me. And yeah, I, you know, I'm glad that there's a reconciliation between the fans in Toronto and Vince because I think it's important for the his, history of the franchise, for the historical look at the franchise, that people understand that, yeah, okay, it didn't end well, but holy crap, what a run it was when he was here. And he got a lovely ovation in his last game in Toronto, yeah. didn't he? Yeah, yeah he, he did. did. And, uh, and it, it, it's good. It made him, it was cathartic moment, that, that game where, you know, he, he was brought to tears by the video tribute, and he should have been. I think the fans are very uh, forgiving and a little bit later than they should have been, but I'm glad, I'm glad it happened. Well, there was quite some transition after Vince left, and I'll just mention some of the things here. There was the firing and hiring of Jay Triano, their one and only Canadian coach, Dwayne Casey, uh, the addition of Masai Ujiri in the front office, the drafting of DeMar DeRozan, trading for players like Kyle Lowry and Serge Ibaka. What was, in your view, the kind of signature key moment that turned around the franchise? I, I honestly think it was when they brought you, uh, Masai back. When you jury, my, Masai Ujiri came back, Tim Lariwicki hired him, I guess, in 2014, maybe it was, 13, 14. That was the moment that... Masai has a strength of character, a strength of a personality that he said, we're going to win in Toronto, and you believed him. Everybody else had said it, but there was something about the way he delivered the message that made people believe. And, you know, he made some very hard decisions over the course of his tenure here. Um, has you know, He traded DeRozan, who was beloved by the fans and wanted to play his entire life here. He fired Dwayne Casey, who was a tremendous coach and a greater man, and was had been here for seven years, so that was not an easy thing to do. But I, there was a, a strength of will to Mazai that you saw right off the bat, and you believed. He was the guy who sat at his introductory news conference next to Tim Lywicki at the time and said, look, I don't want to hear this crap about people that want to come to Toronto. We're going to make it so they want to come to Toronto, and we're going to win here. And you believed him, and I think the fans believed him, and I think the players in the league and agents who run a lot of things believed him. What did you think when, at that public event, he he dropped the F-bomb about Brooklyn? <laughs> Typical Mazai. I'm sorry. He said that kind of stuff to us privately a hundred times before, but that's just like him. He, he's, he's unfiltered. He is very passionate, and he is very steadfast that I'm going to win. You know, that's the thing that, that drives Mazai is winning, and that F-Brooklyn thing was classic. It was classic Mazai. Uh, because that's what he thought, and that's what he said. Well, as you point out, one of his toughest calls was getting rid of Dwayne Casey as the coach in 2018. And as you say in the book, they settled. They settled on Nick Nurse. What does that mean? Well, I, I think they there were a lot of other guys in the mix. You know, they they did they they talked very seriously to Mike Budenholzer, who is now the coach in Milwaukee, who had come off the uh, coach of the year performance in Atlanta, with the Atlanta Hawks. There was a, there were thoughts that they wanted to go get a big name like a, like a Jeff Van Gundy or or a, a coach of that magnitude who might have been unemployed, a George Carl, that kind of guy. You know, Nick had been an assistant and he'd been a, you know, a very key assistant to Dwayne, and he had been a head coach in, in Britain and had been head coach and a coach of the year in the G League or D League as it was called then. So he had some chops, but the hardest thing for guys to do in basketball is move that one seat to the left on the coaching bench. Because now you're not an assistant. You're the guy making the, the calls, and you're doling out playing time, and you're dealing with the personalities. When you're an assistant coach, you're the guy that the players go to to complain about the head coach. Mm. Now, if you move over, you know that the guy sitting to your right, your assistant, the players are complaining to him about you because you've been there. And it takes a special guy to be able to handle that move. And I mean, Nick was a bit of a surprise hire, and as it turned out, inspired. But I think a bit of a surprise hire to a lot of people. In terms of tactics and strategy, Casey versus Nurse, big difference? Yeah, I think Nurse is, I think Nick is far more, uh, I, I use the word improvisational. He, he figures stuff out on the fly and is willing to change on the go. Dwayne was a great coach and is a great coach. I think there was a rigidity to him that, that probably didn't work in the end. He did the same thing, and he got the players to try to do the same thing all the time. With Nick, if things not working, he'll change stuff in the middle of the third quarter. And he might try stuff that's off the wall, boxing one in the NBA Finals, for instance, playing two small guards and Kyle Lowry and, and Fred Van Vliet at the same time for big-time minutes together. That's sort of unconventional thinking. And, and I think that's the kind of thing that he was drawn, that Masai Ujiri was drawn to when he hired him, was his ability to adapt and admit that, okay, my way's not working. Let's try another way. And 
as it turned out, I think that's his greatest strength. that We've seen it in the two years he's been head coach. Hmm. Doug, we're going to show a clip here, and this really does – this is one of the reasons we love sports, because we're going to show two different shots happening here, both against the Philadelphia 76ers. You know where I'm going with this. And they are mirror images of one another. But boy, oh boy, one was the agony and one was the ecstasy. Sheldon, if you would, let's roll it. Carter trying to get free. Carter at the buzzer. No go. And the Sixers hold on and advance to the conference finals. at the clock, turns the corner for the win! We've all probably seen that Kawhi Leonard shot hundreds of times since then, and Every time that ball goes up, I still wonder if it's going to go in. Because <laughs> four bounces, Doug, four bounces. What did you think when you saw it? Well, I, I, well, the first reaction was, holy crap. I can't <laughs> believe what I just saw. Then it was, how am I going to write this? Because I got to do it like right now. But it, it, it was fascinating. But Steve, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is the beauty and the essence of sport in, those, in that minute. Two un, you know, wonderful shots. One didn't go in. One went in. If it happened the other way around, who knows? Like if Vincent's shot goes in, it changes the course of Raptors history, without question. If Kawhi's shot goes out, it changes the course a different way of Raptors history. It, it, it's a fascinating glimpse at what sports is. And I'm so glad. I was one of the few guys who was in the arena for both of those shots. And they both give me goosebumps to this moment. I watched that clip, and in the Vince shot, I got goosebumps. In yep. the Kawhi shot, I still do. It, it's the beauty of the game. And I just, I just love it. We do have to remember that even when Kawhi sunk that shot, that was just the second round. They still had two more rounds to go before winning. And I want to know, honestly now, your hand on a Bible, did you think at the beginning of the playoffs that the Raptors could take it all in 2019? No, I, I did not. I, I, thought, I thought Philly might get them. I, I thought Milwaukee was pretty good, but I thought Philly was a tough. And I didn't think they could beat Golden State if they got to the NBA Finals. It, it, that would have been unfathomable to me i i thought they were good I, well i knew they were a good team but to win a championship it, it takes so much so much luck so much break so many good things have to happen i you talked steve I, you know after that philly series they played milwaukee they were down two nothing in the series playing game three at home kyle lowey follows out with five minutes to go in the fourth quarter they play two overtime periods without him plus the five minutes of the game Pascal Siaka missed a couple of clutch free throws that would have saved the game in the first overtime. If they lose that game, they're out of it. They're down 3 nothing in a conference, conference final, and it's over. So that's the kind of thing that when you start a playoff run, you don't know what's going to happen, but you need, you need a break. And you need a, bad, a good break for you and a bad break for the other guys. And, and so, no, I did not think they would win a championship when those playoffs started. Doug, why were you not at the victory parade? <laughs> well, me and the people don't really get along, and two million of them is way too many for me. <laughs> I I, tr I actually tried to go. I got to the GO station out here in Mississauga, and I think four or six trains went past me that I could not get on because they were too full, and it was like 7 o'clock in the morning. And at that point, I thought, there's no way. There's, there's no chance I'm going to get anywhere that I can do my job. Plus, it was, it was a moment for the people. I, I tell you the truth, I went and sat in my bar and watched it on TV for seven hours, and I had a great time. And, and, and sort of reveled in the, the glory of it privately as opposed to with two million not-so-close friends. <laughs> now, uh, I saw we had a nice picture of you there with the Larry OB, <laughs> but, but even you in your heart of hearts have to acknowledge the Stanley Cup is a prettier trophy than the Larry OB, isn't it? Yeah, I think it probably is. Okay. Probably, mostly because I grew up in the first 60 years of my life looking at the Stanley Cup. But, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, it's a more aesthetically pleasing-looking trophy. Okay, good. On this, we agree. I want to read an observation that you made here in your book, and it goes like this. White, black, brown. 
male, female, transgender, non-binary, old, young, somewhere in between, rich and poor, famous and anonymous. That was the crowd and that was my Canada. It has been the tale of the franchise as well. The story of the Raptors is not only the story of the evolution of a sport and a team, but of a fan base, a society, a country. What do you think, Doug, distinguishes the Raptors from all the other teams in the NBA? I think they, they reach a group of people um, that is far more diverse and far more different than grew up watching hockey. I, the Raptor fans of a certain age, 40-year-olds, 30-year-olds, they didn't grow up watching Saturday night hockey games with their dad. They maybe came from another country where basketball was a, was a big deal. And they came to Toronto and they were able to cheer for their own team. And I think that's, you know, if you look 25 years ago, the kids who were going to games were from Asia, Africa, Europe, South America. They, they, were new, they were new to Canada and new to the sport and had their own team. And if they were 15 years old or 10 years old growing up then, now they're 35 and 40 and they're the fan base. And I think that's a hugely significant part of what the Raptors have been involved in in the evolution of not only basketball, but of Canada and of Toronto and Southern Ontario. And the country, our city, the area looks different now than it looked in 1995. And the Raptors are far more representative of that in their fan base and the way they try to attract people. They, they go out and seek fans from other nations who might be new Canadians. And, and it's paid off for them hugely. We've got a minute left here, and I want to ask you, Doug, the hardest question of all at the end. And that is, <laughs> I need your Mount Rushmore of Raptor players. You've seen every single player who ever put a uniform on play for this team. I want the all-time center, the all-time two best forwards, and the all-time two best guards. Go. Okay, I'm going to go with Kyle Lowry, DeMar DeRozan, Vince Carter, Chris Bosh. And I, you know, Antonio Davis wasn't a center, but I just love the way he played. So I would put him and Jonas Valanciunas in a tie as the Mount Rushmore of positional players. Guys, as people, there's a different group. But as if I had to start a five-man group in the NBA today, that would be my five Raptors. Now, what's interesting about that list is, you know, the, the, the two forwards and the two guards, phenomenal. The Raptors have never really had a singularly phenomenal center. They've never had a Will Chamberlain. They never had a Bill Russell. No. And yet... Right? They won anyway. They won a championship, exactly. Marcus Gasol could probably be on that team. He played here, what, a year and a half? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and now he's gone. Yeah, that's exactly. It's the way it is. All right. How far is this team going this year? I think they got a shooter's chance to win the East. They'll be in that top four group with uh, Brooklyn, Philly, uh, Milwaukee, Boston, Miami. In that top four, top five. And like two years ago, they'll get to the playoffs and stuff will happen, good or bad and they might have a shot to win it. <laughs> well, as is always the wonderful thing about sports, we shall see. Absolutely. Doug, it's so good to have you on the program. We the North, 25 years of the Toronto Raptors. Uh, enjoy the upcoming season as much as you can, given that they're playing in Tampa, and you're not going to get to any games, are you? Probably not, although there's a hope they'll be back in March if things change, but things change hourly, hourly so who knows? Fingers crossed. Good to see you again, Doug. Great, Steve. Take care. Great to see you, too. And that's my last interview on this program for 2020. Hope everybody has a great break. Best of the season. As my dad likes to say, stay positive, but test negative. And we'll see you in 2021. Last month, a tragic loss of life near Lindsay in eastern Ontario triggered the need for the SIU, also known as the Special Investigations Unit, because the shooting involved the Ontario Provincial Police. Marsha McLeod is our new Eastern Ontario Hub journalist, and she joins us now from the provincial capital for more. Welcome to the show. Thank you for the welcome, Dan. Now, Marsha, you are the newest member of TVO's Ontario Hub's regional reporting team. Before we get into your latest, uh, what do you bring to the team uh, with your reporting? Yeah, so a little bit about my background. I've reported on both sides of the U.S.-Canada border. Um, and what I've really focused on in my career so far has been corrections, criminal legal systems, health care, and policing, including fatal shootings by police. And for TVO, though, I'm going to be taking a really pretty wide breath looking at those issues, as well as things like climate change, agriculture, farming, housing and homelessness, and as well as, of course, you know, COVID-19 and the impacts on, on people and the economy. 
Of course. Now, for your first for TVO.org, it was about a fatal shooting by police near Lindsay. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, so on the morning of November 26, the OPP was made aware that a 33-year-old father had abducted his one-year-old child from a home near Bob Cajun. And what we know that happened next is about 30 kilometers away from Bob Cajun, that father, that driver, he slammed into an OPP officer. As that officer was laying down spike strips, he severely injured the officer. And now it gets a little bit murky. We don't know exactly what happened but three officers did fire their weapons at the father, uh, striking him. He died about a week later in hospital. And we know that during that encounter, somebody shot and killed that one-year-old child who was pronounced dead on the scene. And as you mentioned, the SIU is now investigating. Of course, a tragic situation. Uh, but what's so unusual, unusual about this one? Well, what's really unusual about this case is that we don't yet know whether a police officer did in fact shoot that child. And the reason there's some ambiguity is that the SIU has said in press releases that a handgun was located in the suspect's pickup truck. What they have not said is where it was located, whether the father held it, brandished it, fired it. However, we do know it was located. It brings some ambiguity into the situation. And what's really unusual about that is I actually spoke with four lawyers, two of whom former directors of the SIU, and they all said they were unable to think of a similar case where it was uncertain whether a police officer or a civilian shot and killed someone. So it's been a, a, a couple weeks since uh, the shooting took place. What's uh, the progress in terms of the investigation on the SIU? Uh, what have they made public uh, and what do we know? So as of Monday, the SAU said that 14 witness officers and 12 civilians have been interviewed about the incident. Um, the three officers who are the subject of the investigation have not yet been interviewed, but that's not unusual. In Ontario, subject officers are not compelled to give either an interview or provide their notes to the SIU. And this really follows from the fact that it, civilians are not required uh, to give interviews. It's we have the right to remain silent and 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 not provide uh, incriminating testimony. Um, and, and so that's one element. The other element has to do with firearms. So the suspect's firearm, or the firearm that was located in the suspect's truck, has been transferred to the Center of Forensic Sciences, which will do ballistics analysis um, on that firearm. And just very briefly, ballistics analysis is essentially the practice of, or it can include the practice of, of matching bullets or cartridge cases to a particular firearm. So basically seeing seeing which firearm um, uh, shot which bullet. Um, so that the, the suspect's firearm has been transferred. However, the three officers' firearms have not yet been transferred to the CFS. And the SIU says that's because they're waiting for approval uh, from the center. I want to pick up on a, on a point that you made earlier. Uh, do people agree that police uh, here, public servants with guns, should be treated just like civilians? There is some disagreement on that. So for instance, Howard Morton, a former director of the SIU, said to me that he's long disagreed that police officers should not be required uh, to give an interview or provide their notes. His reason being that police officers should be held to a higher standard than the public, given that they're public servants and they carry a firearm. Uh, this, of course, is a small community. What's the reaction been from the ground there? Yeah. So. My sense is that the community is really shaken. Um, Co-Arthur Lake's mayor, Andy Latham, has said the word that he used is, is disbelief, that the community is just really in disbelief that this is something that would happen there. Now, of course, you're going to be keeping an eye on this story. What can we expect as we move forward? There's going to be two main things that I'm looking at. So the first one really is I want to learn more about the events that led up to three officers deciding to discharge their firearms. Um, we really, again, don't know how much time elapsed between when the crash occurred and when those shots were fired. Was it five seconds? Was it 10 minutes, 20 minutes, two minutes? We don't know. Um, and the other thing that I'm really um, looking at is, is the question of whether or not the SIU will inform the public whether a police officer shot this child when they became become aware of that and they confirm that. So, and the reason why that's so significant is that in the past, or at least in, in 2019, the SIU took about six months um, to work through uh, what, what, what they call full-blown cases. So if they decide to wait until the conclusion of the investigation um, to, to release that information, the public could be quite waiting 
quite a significant period of time. I'm curious, um, you know, the SIU has been in the past criticized for how long it can take, um, you know, to complete these investigations. Do we see this being sped up or just based on how tragic the situation is? Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that's really important to note that actually just this month, uh, regulations passed such that for any delays after four months of investigation, the SIU now needs to provide an accounting for why those delays occurring. And I've also heard, you know, sort of competing um, perspectives on whether or not this investigation might be sped up. Um, one individual said to me it might be sped up just because of, uh, you know, there's such public interest in knowing what happened. And somebody else said to me, look, because this is so contentious, it, it may take extra time, you know, having a second individual review the postmortem and et cetera. Marsha, I want to thank you so much for joining us on the show. Of course, something we will keep our eyes um, out for. That's Marsha McLeod, our Eastern Ontario Hub journalist. Thank you so much. Thank you. And that is our final Hubs check-in of 2020. I want to thank our viewers for tuning in throughout the year. I want to wish everyone a happy holidays, and we will see you again next year. That is the agenda for Friday, December 18th, and for this strange and challenging year, 2020. Over the next two weeks, TVO has lots of holiday programming for your viewing pleasure. From Victorian bakers to emergency room veterinarians, there is something for everyone, so please tune in. I'm Nam Kiwanuka, thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org. Wishing you a very happy holiday season. Have a great weekend, and Steve will see you here the first Monday of 2021. The Agenda with Steve Bacon is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. Ontario hubs are made possible by the Barry and Lori Green Family Charitable Trust and Goldie Feldman. And by viewers like you. Thank you.